Okay, if you guys are ready, we'll go. We'll get started. We are really excited to have two of our pilot districts with us today to talk about some of their work. And let me give full disclosure before we start. Our work so far hasn't been the reason for their success at all. They're, they were very successful LEAs before we started the pilot, but quickly joined in to be part of this work. And we're really excited to have them both here because they're two very different size LEAs, but can talk about how this, this process works in their districts and uh, share some of their successes and what they hope to do next uh, as part of the pilot. So with us today from Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, we have Sarah Harmon and Stephanie Daniel. And uh, you guys will come. It's, I'm going to turn it over to them and let them tell you a little bit about the work that they've been doing in Winston-Salem. And you're all... Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I am the program manager for health and physical education in Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools. I actually just moved into this role in January, so a lot of the work that I'll be telling you about is actually work that has gone on prior to my joining of the LEA. Um, but I am with Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools. And just to give you a little background um, of our school health advisory council, we have kind of two primary partners that are our major players in our school health advisory council, um, our school district, and then also our school health alliance for Forsyth County. Um, and that is who Stephanie Daniel is representing today. So if you don't know about our district, um, or just kind of a refresher for those of you who may know but don't know the specifics, um, we were formed in 1963 when Winston-Salem City Schools merged with Forsyth County Schools. We're the fourth largest system in the state of North Carolina and the 81st largest system in the nation. You can look at the breakdown of our schools there. Um, we have 43, 14, and 15 respectively at each of the levels. And then we also have nine non-traditional settings, um, either because those may be for special needs students, our early college and middle college programs. We have a couple of alternative education sites. Um, so we do have nine that are non-traditional in that breakdown of elementary, middle, and high, which totals 81 schools and approximately 54,000 students in our district. So to give you a little background on our School Health Alliance, it, was, it is a nonprofit partner um, that is basically a supporting organization for our school system. And the mission there is primarily to improve the health and safety for our school-aged children through each of those two goals, um, both through the, the provision of direct services on site in schools, which for us looks like school-based health clinics, um, and then also by coordinating and targeting the efforts and resources of all types of community health care providers. So they are a huge component in the success of our School Health Advisory Council. And our partnership with them began in 1997, um, along with some other agencies. So we're talking about a pretty long-term relationship to get to where we are today. And then the way our shack is set up, because um, one of the things that when Ellen and Kelly came out to do a site visit with us that they were most impressed with is the number <coughs> of members that we actually have. So the way that our shack is structured um, ever since January of 2004 is that we kind of per serve school system and school health advisory on guidance of policy issues that affect student health. Um, and what we've done since kind of assuming the role of shack, the school health advisory, um, our school health alliance, I'm sorry, has also become the forum for addressing any kind of community health issues. So Stephanie's going to speak in a moment about Operation Zero Suspension um, because we knew in our community, being LEA2 that Ellen talked about earlier, <laughs> that we had an issue with students who were being excluded from instruction because of the mandatory requirements for health assessments and immunizations. And so we worked with those on, on an example like that to be able to provide opportunities for our community to be successful um, and address that health need. And then the third through the sixth bullet, or fifth bullet, I'm sorry, actually talk about how our board is set up. So our board members also serve as SHAC members, and then the board president is the one who chairs all of our monthly meetings, or our bi-monthly meetings. Um, and they are all at the table at the same time. So what they do is the SHAC um, board of directors are going to meet immediately prior. So we have a, a 12 to 1 p.m. meeting, and then we have a 1 to 2 p.m. meeting. So that way members and board members can all be at the table all on the same day in the same time, excuse me, same time frame. <coughs> and then these are some of our contributing partners. Um, being in Winston-Salem, we have major medical facilities that are there, which is also a huge thing um, when you're looking at our success. 
So kind of our major contributors, we have seven representatives from the school system, three from the School Health Alliance, six from our Department of Public Health from all different avenues, and then a few from Wake Forest Baptist, and we have three parent representatives who come as well. And then in all of our other agencies, we usually only have maybe one representative um, who comes from any of the logos you see down at the bottom or any of the list on the right hand side. And then I'm going to let Stephanie talk because Stephanie has been involved with the School Health Alliance and the um, School Health Advisory Council for much longer about kind of how we've collaborated and some of the work that we've done that um, we feel the most proud of. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Daniel and um, I serve as the Executive Director for the School Health Alliance for Forsyth County and I'm also a faculty member in Family and Community Medicine at Wake Forest School of Medicine. And um, just to tell you a little bit about more about our shack and how we work together, over the years it's really been about partnership and relationship building not only with individuals but with the agencies that are at the table. Um, it's also been about common interest and shared goals. Um, identifying what the community needs are and figuring out strategies or solutions for partnering and collaborating, working together to um, work um, towards those common interests and shared goals. It's also been really helpful to us to have decision makers at the table. Um, so from many of the, the um, member organizations that Sarah showed you, um, we have at least one decision maker from that organization at the table. Um, and it just helps to move things along and decisions can happen more quickly when you have the decision maker at the table. Um, we develop an annual SHAC plan and the way we've done this is we um, historically have identified at least one goal in each of what used to be eight and now um, ten of the WIS component areas. Um, our SHAC reviews those goals and then approves the SHAC plan and goals on an annual basis. Um, the other thing that we found really um, helpful in our community has been for each of those goals to list a person who's responsible for completing and reporting on the progress toward the goal. Um, so it gives somebody ownership and the responsibility of actually coming back to our meetings and, and reporting out on that goal. Um, and then the other thing that we've done is each goal identifies the SHAC meeting date for reporting progress to date on that goal. So it just keeps everything moving um, um, in a forward direction. This is um, our SHAC plan um, with the specific goals that we identified for 2016-2017 and I won't read through those but you can kind of see that again there's at least one goal in each of the the um, 10 <coughs> component areas of the WISC model. So um, this is probably um, the most exciting thing for me to share with you is some of the highlights from the work of our SHAC. So um, Sarah mentioned Operation Zero Suspension. Um, truth be told, we were probably a little ambitious to think that we would get our suspensions down to zero, but that was our goal and our target. Um, <laughs> So um, how this began was the superintendent of our school district came to me and other members of the shack and said we really need help decreasing the number of mandatory suspensions that are happening as a result of non-compliance with, at the time, kindergarten health assessments and sixth grade immunizations and now it's um, seventh grade immunizations. So we, our first um, effort to try to reduce the number of mandatory um, suspensions happened in summer of 2014. And each year we've continued this initiative to try to further decrease the um, number of mandatory suspensions due to noncompliance with um, health assessments and immunizations. And we've taken the information that we've learned from one year um, and carried it into the next to figure out what we need to do differently. So it's really been an iterative process to get us from where we started to where we are today. So um, I'm not sure if I am a skilled pointer user, but let me just try to show you these numbers. Let's see, I did it this way. Can you see it? It might be too far away. Oh. Did I have it? No, I got it over You here. got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use I'm going to try to be a skilled mouse user. You can put it up on the screen. It's probably, is it wrong? It'll do. There you go. So um, 
here's where we started. This was our baseline um, data right here. So we had 333 kindergartners that were suspended from school due to non-compliance with kindergarten health assessments in the 2013-14 school year. Now, remember, we're a larger district, so we have over 54,000 um, students in our districts. <laughs> um, but it, to us, it still seemed like a very high number, and um, our, again, our goal was to reduce that number. So, um, the so the first year, um, and this was um, this number, 333, is actually kindergarten health assessments um, and or vaccines. It was combined. The way the data were shared with us were combined that year. So the first, um, that first, that summer um, of 2014, we thought, well, if we just take the clinical services to the neighborhoods where the kids um, um, are located, um, and the way we determined that was we looked at the schools that had the highest suspension rates, and so we took mobile medical clinics to the schools with the highest suspension rates, and we thought we would get some traction <laughs> with reducing the number of mandatory suspensions. And you'll see, um, if you follow this slide down, we made some traction. So we um, reduced from 333 to 289, um, but it, it wasn't quite what we had hoped. Um, um, and is sort of implied in our Operation Zero suspension efforts. So we just we revisited. Well, what were some of the things that um, that helped that were problematic in terms of moving the needle further than what we moved it? And we found that providers in our community often didn't know that children were being suspended from school if they didn't have the health assessments or the immunizations. And we found that in some cases, kids were staying suspended till November, sometime in November. There were a few outliers even to December because they weren't able to get in with their primary care physician to get the health assessment completed or to get the immunizations completed. So we worked with Northwest Community Care Network, who is our local Medicaid manager, and they contacted all of the pediatricians and family providers in our community to educate around suspensions and to educate the um, scheduling staff and all of the practices about screening for families who were calling in for appointments. And it was as simple as just saying, are you calling for a kindergarten health assessment appointment? Um, and are you calling to um, get immunizations for school? Um, and just those little changes you'll see um, made the difference. So the next year we dropped to 129. The other thing that we did was um, during this year we realized that often parents didn't realize that their children could be suspended or removed from school until they had these things completed. So it was really a two-pronged approach in that second year where we spent a lot of time educating parents and we spent a lot of time educating providers. Um, and then the next year, you'll see, um, so we were pretty pleased that we were um, at 129 from 333, but the next year, we continued everything that we had done in the years before, so we still had mobile clinics, we were still educating providers, we were still educating families. Um, we also started um, providing transportation to some of the students who transport for whom transportation was a barrier to get to a clinic site or to providers. And then um, for this this year here, we um, we had data for the first time ten days prior to the suspension deadline, and our numbers were over two thousand kids that were at risk of being suspended. 10 days prior to the, um, to the suspension deadline. We had no data to compare to from the previous years at that 10 day mark because it hadn't been tracked or reported to our, our work group. Um, so we don't know if 2000 was typical for 10 days out or if it was um, really extreme compared to previous years. Um, but what we did was we partnered with both of our medical centers to open up additional clinics and, and appointments for kindergartners and those that needed immunizations to prioritize getting kids in quickly 
so that they weren't suspended from school. So, um, so again, that's, oops, I think I just, Sorry, we're punching between the mouse and the, <laughs> the clicker now. Um, there we go. So, so you can see we moved the needle down to 90 kindergartners who were suspended. And um, you know, while our goal is still zero, we are pleased that we're in double digits instead of triple digits. Um, it's been, um, the, I'll say the other thing that happened in that 2016-17 school year, and many of you probably experienced this as well, um, any student transferring into North Carolina public schools from outside the district also had to have a health assessment um, and immunizations had to be up to date. So you'll see we have um, that 1 through 12, grades 1 through 12 health assessment bullet that's just in the 16-17 year. That was the number of students that were in grades 1 through 12 who were transferring into our district who didn't have the required health assessment. Oh, that number, um, that's the total numbers. Um, so if you combine all the numbers below, that's the total number. Um, you had so, to add in those seven days. Yeah, so we had to add in the, the grades 1 through 12 that didn't have the health assessment yeah. um, for our district, so it bumped the numbers back up a bit. So, um, and for us, I'll say too, that number, many of those kids that were transferring in from outside um, a North Carolina public school, um, were from out of the country. So we also had, in getting them health assessments, we had language barriers and, that we had to overcome as well to make sure that they got the services that they needed. Okay. Yeah? The seventh um, grade immunizations that they have to have, so that's not causing the same kind of problem with suspension. No, so what happened there was in that 2014-15 year, I believe that it was still sixth grade immunizations. So, so many of the kids when they moved into the 2015-16 year, providers were already just giving them at sixth grade even though it was no longer required at sixth grade. So, you know, our numbers look pretty good there because providers were being proactive and just saying, you're age eligible to receive these vaccines. I'm just going to go ahead and give them to you now. Um, and so that, that worked out fairly um, to our advantage. <laughs> and there's, there's students probably tell their parents by that point as well. Right, right. So I think some of the lessons that we learned, and, um, and, and you all shared this in the group discussion earlier for LEA2, <laughs> um, but it really was a system effort, and it really was a community collaborative. It wasn't just one agency or one person that worked together to move the needle on these numbers. Um, and our team is still in place, um, and we're still working to continue to address the issues, and um, we're in the process of planning for this summer, and we have summer clinics scheduled. Um, we have the medical centers on standby again to open up and offer extra clinic access to kids who need it. Um, we have the letters going out to providers, letters going out to families. So the other piece that Northwest Community Care Network was able to do is our Medicaid manager. For any of the Medicaid enrolled kids and families, they were able to actually make phone calls to anybody who had a child in that rising kindergartner range to say, we just want to make sure you know that your child will need a kindergarten health assessment um, and that that has to be complete before the, 30 days of, the first 30 days of school in order for them to stay in school. Um, and that's been part of our parent education piece. So um, again, lots of different community agencies coming together to make this work. Um, another highlight that I'll share, um, and, and the data might not be quite as interesting, but it's still um, something that we um, work together on is the SHAC. We've done a lot of advocacy for school nurse positions in our county, um, and we have, um, or what we did was we organized presentations by both professional experts and parent experts on managing children's chronic health conditions in schools, and we um, presented those um, presentations to our county commissioners and in May 2015 that resulted in the addition of eight school nurse positions within our school district um, and our school nurses are actually hired through the health department so it was addition of eight school nurses hired through the health department 
Um, and then in May 2016, we had one to two that were added as a result of the advocacy work. And then I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah to tell you a little bit about our Fuel Up to Play um, 60 grant. So I'm actually really glad that Ellen mentioned that earlier. That's low-lying fruit. <laughs> and it's one of those things that's not sustainable if you just take the money and implement a program. So we were really fortunate as a district this past year to get $48,000. So each of the 12 schools that were selected received $4,000. They had to do two plays. If you know anything about Fuel Up to Play 60, they had to do one that was physical activity based and they had to do one that was school nutrition based. So the one that we found for physical activity was increasing recess. So we picked 12 schools based off of their BMI data and said, okay, at these 12 schools, we're gonna try to provide some structured recess materials, whether that be packets that are created in-house, materials that are purchased through some of our equipment vendors, um, and we're gonna pilot this and see how it goes. So what I'm really excited about is that while that $2,000 may not be sustainable for recess at every school every year, we've learned some really valuable lessons there about how we can make impactful decisions that will do the best with the money that we have and that can also have then the greatest impact. And the same thing with the breakfast participation, much more successful. We have some schools where 100% of our students qualify for free and reduced. We have some that don't. In that 12 school pilot, we had three schools that increased their breakfast participation in double digits. One school almost doubled their morning breakfast participation, and it was a matter of just structurally changing how breakfast was made available. So they used that $2,000 to incentivize the school to say, give this a try. And what they found is that all the resistance they had when they had that money to make it possible has changed their entire philosophy about breakfast in the classroom. So Kernersville Elementary School and our principal there, Shane O'Neill, said every kid is gonna eat breakfast in the classroom. They're gonna to come to school and go straight to their room and breakfast is gonna be there waiting on them. So we learned some lessons that, you know, there was a lot of waste. Well, how do we make sure we're not wasting? Well, it's about changing our marketing message. And it's saying, your breakfast is on the table, Johnny, get it and go have a seat, rather than breakfast is over there if you want it. And so by changing some of our messaging, we didn't have to change our money, we didn't have to change what was available. And then we also found teachers who would say, we're not throwing that apple away. So now instead of parents bringing in you know, off-brand cookies for snack, the teacher has stashed away 10 apples from breakfast that weren't eaten, and now here's your morning snack class. So what we found is that the teacher buy-in and all these things, because of these grants, has been so great that some of these programs are gonna be pilots in our summer school that then we hope to implement on a much wider scale in the years coming up. So the grant in this situation just gave us the base to say these are some amazing things we can do and now we have advocates in schools who will help us promote that work. Questions about any of our highlights? Yep. Um, you said increasing recess? Mm -hmm. um, Structured recess. So we didn't actually increase the amount of time. What we did is try to make sure that students were not just sitting during recess and that they had gameplay opportunities and a quit note with which to use by providing packets where the teachers were trained and our PE teachers trained the kids on some of the games to play so that when they go out, hopefully they would be engaging in more moderate to vigorous physical activity during the time that they were still allotted. Would you be allowed to increase recess if you wanted to? It would be one of those as a part of the pilot. Um, if we could get some decision makers on board, I think we have a really strong wellness policy in accordance with the Healthy Children Act where we actually ensure that at least 20% of the instruction is provided with a licensed physical educator, um, which is at least some framework that gives us some moving points moving forward to say, let's look at the numbers, let's look at time, let's look at what we can do. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what extra effort or support do you give that classroom teacher uh, for breakfast in the room? So a lot of it at first, there was not a lot of support. It was top down, you are going to do this. And in schools where they were the most successful, it was that the morale was so strong there that if that leader said, hey, this is what we need to try to do, the team just took it on and said, you know what, if that's what's best for kids, that's what we'll do. And most of the resistance to breakfast in the classroom was the fear of mess or the fear of lost instructional time. And both of those concerns resolved themselves so quickly 
that it didn't take very long before all the team players were really supportive of it. Mm -hmm. How did the mess resolve itself? <laughs> the biggest issue there, it was figuring out how to structure trash pickup. So what they found is that if they would use some of this money to mobilize more of those large trash cans that we see in cafeterias, so now there would be two on each hallway, for example. Or what some of our schools did, like Easton Elementary, where they're also 100% free and reduced, they did pod-based breakfast. So rather than having the kids come pick up, because there was a fear that there would be mess on the way to the room, they actually took the breakfast to the rooms. And they found that two through five never had any trouble. It also established some life lessons that, you know, if you spill your milk or your whatever, you get a paper towel, you clean it up, and we move on. Um, the K-1 has been a little more difficult to resolve, but that's where sometimes selective breakfast choices help reduce some of that mess, too. Um, but in general, it was things like increasing trash can visibility, how does breakfast get to the room, and then it kind of didn't have any of the major issues in the room. I will press the point. One That's last okay. question. Yep. No personnel in the classroom teacher that cleaned up any mess. Is that correct? You didn't provide any more staff right. to help them? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. What we found is that because nobody was sitting in the cafeteria and nobody was having to monitor students in the gym, that freed up that supervision to now be over breakfast. And so what our cafeteria staff did, because they weren't having to clean the cafeteria now, and they weren't having to do all these things in the cafeteria, is they were able to mobilize and go pick up trash cans and go pick up things so that then it just moved their services to the broader location instead of it being isolated in the cafeteria. Yep. I just want to congratulate you for the, the work. It's really inspiring to see the systems level change that it's not, oftentimes, I mean, I'm sure it feels like big change, yeah, but it's these kinds of true collaborations and thinking about that that can really make the biggest impact. And mm -hmm. both this and the suspension is just, I hope there's ways, and I'm assuming through the pilots, that this can really be thought about across the state because the suspension piece in particular is, um, I'm sure it's not, I don't mean to imply it wasn't a lot of work. It's not as heavy of a lift as some other ways to go about addressing those problems. So very impressive. Uh, I'd like to brag on our, my community a bit. Um, <laughs> um, having spent a lot of time there, um, we do have some of the lowest performing schools in the state, uh, primarily as a result of our choice plan where, where we have some highly concentrated poverty schools, so the, the need is there. The community is, is now in the middle of a project impact. $45 million over the next six years is going to be placed in the community, and, and the fact that you guys are willing to pilot the uh, whole child model with it is going to, going to model up really nicely, and I think the data that you're going to get from you guys are going to be really good. So thank you very much for making me feel proud of my hometown. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. And then we just had on our last slide just some of our plans for how we plan to use it, but it basically goes back to what we've already talked about, is using what we've learned from piloting within our own district to figure out how we can then make sure that we're looking at pre and post assessments um, we've talked that a lot of our data has been more of the bean counting kind of data so far because the people who were in leadership positions <coughs> knew the needs and knew what we needed to address because of their connections in the community, but we haven't always looked at where were we and where are we now. And that's the thing we're the most excited about with the, excuse me, with the pilot is now we're going to have some real strong points to say this is where we moved or this is where we didn't and what can we do to address that. Thank you. Great work. Um, and we're excited too. Uh, what's the time? Forsyth has YRBS data from several years, so they have some trend data and they can actually see how things have, have already started to move or where they're moving because of those trends. So we're really excited about that. So that's a larger district. Uh, now I'm going to ask Mary Jane Eckerman, and uh, she's here with Dr. Patrice Faison, the superintendent, to talk a little bit about what's going on in a, a smaller district. I'm just here for more support. <laughs> <laughs> so, good afternoon. I'm Mary Jane Aikerman. Um, 
until December. I was the wellness coordinator for Thomasville City Schools. In January, I shifted positions, and I'm now the executive director of communities and schools of Thomasville. Um, but because I've been working on wellness in Thomasville City Schools um, for so long, Ellen asked me to come and talk a little bit about what we've done. And I'm thrilled to be able to sort of compare um, and contrast some of the things that we're doing in a small district just south of Winston-Salem. Um, a couple of things. One, um, our district size, we are significantly smaller. We're a city school system, so we have four schools, two elementary, a middle, and a high. We have a total of 2,400 students. Um, so we are much smaller. Um, but some of the things that I think are important is that um, so many ways that we are like um, the big system uh, in, in Forsyth, Winston-Salem. One is the fact that our commitment to integrating with the whole child. Um, it's something that we've been doing for a long time, um, back before it was whole child, when it was coordinated school health. Um, that was something that we did was look at the then eight components, now 10, and sort of assess our progress across all of those components. Another thing that we've been doing for a very long time, again, like Winston-Salem, is relying on community partners to do this work. I feel like um, I listen to their list of how many medical providers and all that in Winston. We certainly don't have that in Thomasville. But what we do have are those partnerships that make it so much, so much more critical for us to be successful because we don't have a large school system infrastructure. So we rely on our community partners. So the first thing we did years ago was build a community team. I do want to tell you just a little uh, bit about our School Health Advisory Council. So because we are a, in a county that has three school systems, our Davidson County Tri-District Shack, it's all three school systems in it, and we really are more, our shack is more sort of a big picture, we make um, policies and then the shack makes recommendations to the three, three individual school systems. So we get some great information and networking and sharing at the shack, but where our real work is done, and it really is our shack, is our Thomasville City School Wellness Council, and that's where the school system, we look <coughs> at the 10 components of the whole child model and look to um, put in a pl plan every year on what we're gonna address, identify where our needs are, and prioritize what we can focus on. I did want to share, though, um, this incredible list, I think, of community partners and tell you about a program that we um, have been doing for a number of years and sort of how it addresses a lot of um, the different components of the whole child. It was about seven years ago now that our um, Rotary, Thompson Rotary Club, um, came to the school system and said we'd like to uh, work with you to address child obesity. We had a very ambitious program to update every playground in every park in Thomasville, and they applied for an international rotary grant, which they did not get. <laughs> but um, the kind of community that Thomasville is, we said we're not going to quit there. So um, raising money through um, local foundations, local employers, um, the school system was able to find some funds to put in it. Um, and through that collaboration, we did replace the playground equipment in every single city park. Um, and I started a program um, that seven years ago um, that we call Party in a Park. We did it initially quarterly. We're now doing it twice a year in the spring and the fall. We rotate around from community parks. Um, we had one scheduled for um, the first of May, that first Thursday in May, and um, it rained. The bottom <laughs> dropped down. So that morning we made a decision to move from an outside park into um, the Parks and Rec gym. So you can see we made the whole thing work inside. Um, that program, which was originally started to address childhood obesity, provides physical activity and we're very intentional about looking to um, work with families to engage them with their children so it's not just a one-time thing but they see how much fun it is to do physical activity with their children. We have seen um, in the parks in Thomasville a huge increase in the number of people who are using those playgrounds. It's also an opportunity for us to engage parents. <coughs> so we um, work very hard to have the entire families come out to the event. 
we provide a meal because we participate in um, the USDA supper program. Uh, we were able to feed children through that program, and then the parents, um, our child nutrition department, provided <coughs> meals for them um, that our community college covered the cost of that. So again, yeah, a community partnership to make this work. So it was a free event for families. It's community involvement because we have, um, that's the area of the gym where all the physical activity was and the DJ doing the dancing and things like that. In another room, we had um, education where our um, local medical ministry had a table about the services they offer, including their new dental service. The community college offers information about programs that they have. Um, communities and schools was there, our nurses are there. So we provide community involvement, health education, nutrition environment, because our neutral nutrition department provides the food, so it's a nutritious meal and we were able to share information about our food programs at school. And that's health services, because our partnership with Novant, um, Thompson Medical Center, they provide health screenings for parents. So just in a little one night event with large number of community partners, we're able to address half of our 10 components. So um, addressing whole child is not just something that large districts can do. It can be done <coughs> in small communities. Um, I don't really consider us rural, but it certainly can be done. We, we mirror rural communities in a lot of ways in our, our size. I'm really excited about the um, assessment tool uh, that I understand you all saw some of earlier. Well, we told them you helped us, thank you. Um, I'm really excited about it because it's a way for us to really do a better job, sort of ramp up our continual improvement in our assessing across the 10 components. And I just had a couple of examples that I wanted to um, share and sort of things that we're looking forward to as we move ahead. So our percentage of student eating fruit, we provide, we have 100% um, universal um, breakfast, free breakfast in the classroom for all of our students. We've done that for a number of years. We're 100% um, um, free lunch. We do a supper feeding program. Communities and schools provide food backpacks for the weekend. So we think we're doing a great job addressing uh, good nutrition. But when I saw that we were a little low compared to the state and the national on students eating fruit, that surprised me because they're offered fruit multiple times a day. But knowing that gives us an opportunity to go back and look at sometimes it's not just access, this might be a matter of education. Um, and so it, it gives us a chance to go back and look at things that we think we know. Like we think we have the food thing taken care of, but it lets us go back and look at it and assess and figure out how we can address that and improve that. And we'll be able to watch that trend year after year. Another one um, that stuck out to me was the percent of students using some method to prevent pregnancy. Thomasville City Schools is doing, I believe, an outstanding job doing pregnancy prevention for um, 17 years. I can say that because I've been involved that long. Um, so we really feel like, and we have seen a tremendous decrease in our number of teen births in our school system. But saying that number compared to the state and the other schools that are in the pilot, lets us know that we still have work to do there. And so things that we kind of feel like we already have in the bag, we need to go back and look at and make sure that we're doing continuous improvement. So I'm really excited about um, being a part of this pilot, the things that the state is doing around whole child, <coughs> because we've been doing this for a long time, but knowing that other districts are doing it gives that opportunity to compare how we're doing and to look for ways to continue to seek that additional um, improvement. Just be observer here. Um, and um, one of the things that I will say is, um, this is new for me, I just joined the district in March, but one of the things that I'm really excited, and I would ask this team to hold us accountable and, and, and make sure you go back and look at, one of the focuses that we have is attendance for next year. Our attendance is a great area of concern, so we actually are calling, having what we call an attendance campaign that will fit right into this, where we're working to get our whole community involved in um, making sure Bulldogs show up and they show out. It's going to be our campaign, so 
when you're back around the table next year this time, make sure you look at our attendance data and see how that's worked out for us because um, it's one of the things that really has me excited about this program is the attendance, the community um, involvement, and the family engagement with this piece. You guys don't know this, but this, I wasn't, I, I, I thought, oh, this is one more thing to do. But when these two ladies uh, made me see, hey, it fits right in what you need, now it's like, wow, I, I've got more support. So I would say, please look at that, because our attendance campaign is, is exciting for us. And Dr. Payton, I appreciate it. And we have been blessed in Thomasville with some great school district leadership over the years. Um, I, I will just say this, that um, our last um, three superintendents have received the North Carolina Healthy School Superintendent of the Year Award. So we're looking for a current one. Pressure one. I also want to say I visited uh, a year or so ago when Dr. P.G. Martin was there and, and saw firsthand some of the community uh, collaboration you have. Uh, uh, perhaps the most impressive food locker room I've ever seen <laughs> with backpacks ready to go. Um, it is a uh, it's, it's a sign of the times that we have to do that. But uh, the fact that you coordinated that within your community without additional funding uh, is, is what this is all about, is coordinating the services in there. Uh, as I was sitting here thinking about it, both Winston Sodom and you guys, how do you do ice screens? So we um, are fortunate enough with a partnership with uh, Davidson County Health Department to have a nurse in every school. So our school nurses do the screening. We also partnered with our Lions Club, and they uh, made the investment several years ago to get one of those screener uh, machines. So well, I was um, going to give a shout out. She mentioned the Kernsville Elementary School. The Kernsville Lions Club has, has done incredible number of screenings in that end of the county. And if the other areas are not using their civic clubs for that, there's an awful lot of retirees that would like to go around and, and interact with kids on a, on a day basis. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's uh, again, a no cost issue and if a child needs to be able to, be, to see to, to learn it, it's an impactful thing to do so that's the kind of synergy that i think that this thing can, can take off on so it'd be interesting to see you guys come back with uh, some of your ideas so that other communities and other agencies can join you absolutely absolutely yeah in addition to our nurses um, we tap into local universities and get um, student interns <coughs> help them do process the screening. So, yeah, it, it really is all about not just schools doing this by ourselves, but to do it um, with the whole community. We also will be, and I don't even know if you know this yet, but um, we will also be working with um, it's a North Carolina agency that will be doing dental screenings, and then if the kids need caps, they do them as well. I can't think of the organization I met with the lady not too long ago. She'll be starting at the primary school, so we're getting that in place as well. I think too one of the interesting and it'll be exciting to see when you look at kind of looking at absenteeism and you'll also find out what's causing that absenteeism if you start looking mm -hmm. at your data mm -hmm. and you can address the, the root causes of the absenteeism, not just that they're not here, but why are they not here right. and how can we address those issues. So I think that's what the assessment tool and, and looking at data helps us do is to see what are the reasons they're not here. That's where we need to target more than the fact they're not here, but why are they not here? So I think that will that will help. I'm excited. I look forward to seeing your data. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the biggest thing is educating people, just like yourselves, <coughs> educating us. And, you know, you always talk about the whole child, but you, you are so afraid as an educator, so many things to do, but show us that they all, we need to continue mm -hmm. to show people that all of this fits right in. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing anything different um, than I wanted to do or plan to do. Everything that we're talking about fits right into educating that whole child and making sure that ultimately, like the lady said over here, it's about achievement and all of it fits. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to celebrate your successes and to remark on the school districts and your community involvement. I'd like to take an opportunity as well to this group to Come on. celebrate. Come on. <laughs> This is Dr. Land Harvey from School Nutrition. Thank you. We'd just like to take an opportunity for this group to celebrate what we just heard as a success. Shortly after the Interagency Council was formed, we were charged with looking for uh, opportunities to overcome barriers that prevent some of the things we know should be done for children. And one of those high on our radar screen at the time was the at-risk after-school meal program because schools were not able to participate. So under the leadership of our, our chair, 
We sat down with conversations with the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Public Instruction, and over about a four to six month period of time, we worked through those barriers so that we hear the success that you're describing in the at-risk after-school meal program as a result of that work. So I think that this group should applaud its effort as we're beginning to see the successes that we're going here uh, actually implemented locally. So thank you for your leadership to continue. Thank you for your support of the school nutrition program as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's awesome. So just a, a few kind of follow-ups to, to both of these um, groups. I'll have to say that both of these school districts are ones that when we need something, we call. Uh, and clearly we called them today too, but uh, I don't know how many times I said, I bet Stephanie, Stephanie knows the answer to that, uh, because I'm in several things with Stephanie, or Mary Jane will do it, uh, which is what I'm I'm beginning to say that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and when you talk about the school meals, I'll, I'll have to give a shout out to your school nutrition folks because they have some of the best food in the world. Uh, we always ask awesome. to do professional development in Thomasville so we can be fed by them. Uh, so there's a lot of um, great work going on with our districts, and I think uh, whether they're small or they're large, and I, I think looking at percentages, that's why looking at this data with our help and uh, a percentage of 1% for a district the size of Thomasville versus, that might be one student, a 10% might be, you know, a percentage might be one student versus a district as large as Western Southern Forsyth, and that percentage is a lot more students. So. We really, it's good to look at those numbers and move through that data and see where it, it takes, it leads us. And I'm looking forward to using some of the successes of these two districts to share with the other groups, the other folks in the pilot. And they all have district successes as well. Those are just two that we knew off the top of our head and they're gracious enough to be here with us this afternoon and they do great work. So we're glad to give them that shout out. You'll be hearing about from more folks as we go through. Um, before we close up also, and I'll let Maria take us to there, but I also want to remind you that you have a uh, poster in front of you. Uh, if you need more of those, we can make that happen, but we hope you'll take it back and put it up and remind people <laughs> of where the work fits. It's been really nice at, to watch the state board work in this, in this area and point to that picture on the wall over and over again to say this is how this fits. Uh, and we start thinking in that mindset of how does this fit and how can we get our community and our work in that. Um, I'm very proud to announce that the Division of Public Health Office now has electronic bulletin boards in all three of our buildings. So if you can also send me this electronically, I will request that it go up in all of our buildings. That is wonderful. Thank you. And Les is on it. You can get it to you. Uh, we have a, a different shape one that will that, fit better on those TVs okay, and this great. one. So we can get it there. Thank you so much. We'll do it. Uh, Maria? Thank you. So again, we want to thank our school districts for joining us and sharing their stories. And I've been taking notes uh, regarding some next steps that we can include in our work. One would be a list of those innovative practices. And so we know that each pilot will be sharing a success story with us. And we're going to organize that in a way that can be public to everyone. So hearing about the immunization efforts, for example, would be something that would be posted on the Whole Child NC website. So other districts could possibly replicate that work. So no, that is certainly a next step for us. We also heard today ensuring that our data for school suspensions and attendance goes pre-K through elementary and then also middle school and high school and ensuring we take a look at that. So we're gonna include that as part of our assessment tool work. We also heard today that we need to uh, disaggregate the data or give our pilots tools to help them do that work. And so that is another next step for us. And then I also heard something about progress monitoring tools. I think you mentioned earlier as well and including that in our toolkits. So we're gonna take this feedback um, and incorporate it into some of our next steps. But what are additional next steps for this work from the group? I, I think I heard Ellen mention that for the absenteeism, mm -hmm. there will be data on reason for absenteeism. And so that's... Well, I'm saying school districts will have to determine that for themselves. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we won't have it. We would have, we could probably sort that by power school, but 
it, you're getting into excuse versus excuse, and, and unfortunately, well, I should say unfortunate, but an excuse mm -hmm. has to, to be my mom writes me a note that I was sick that day. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that. <laughs> we will, we have, we're the owners of that data. We're wounded right now because the person who managed that for us for years retired, and then the next person we put in the job to handle that retired about two weeks after that. So actually, um, we just finished, and I'm going up to Kim Martin in the Center for Sacred Schools. We just finished interviewing, and I hope we're going to hire somebody soon. Give me a yes. real good nod on that. Uh, and we will then, to Nancy earlier, earlier in the meeting about whether uh, the suspension, for example, was based on immunization or something else. We may have that. I just don't know because I've never dug down in there far enough to see that. And I don't have anybody right now to look for it either. So as soon as we can get that up, if we don't, if we aren't, getting that that way. That is something we do have the power to control and so we start asking for it. Right. And, and I do know to your point about power school, I think I think it, that we can get it and also definitely we can get it about the um, attendance stuff. It's clearly out there on power school. But uh, I made a note of that to be sure to get with Kim and to, to look at that to see how. So that, that's the next step for us. Okay. Well, I, one of the reasons I ask is because one of my other hats that I wear um, is asthma, and I understand that asthma often is a leading cause of absenteeism in school. And um, there is an evidence-based intervention strategy to address asthma triggers in the home and in the school, and we are working uh, hard to make this service a little more widely av available as a part of a broader Healthy Homes initiative that addresses both lead and asthma. So if we find out that asthma is uh, a, a leading cause of school absenteeism, we have some interventions that we can share. Can Dr. Peek, you want to go? Certainly. Lynn just whispered to me and asked me the question too, and I've seen this from not only uh, anecdotally, but the newspaper and others in places as well, about bullying, which is something we are working on in the Center for Sacred School. We know that kids will report that they don't want to go back to school because they're being bullied, and they're actually afraid to go. And so that is something that I think we need to uh, enhance our understanding of. So and, and we're on that, too. We're, we're going to we're do that. I, I just wanted to share, we have on our website, if a district wants it, um, an interactive map of chronic absenteeism for schools that serve, have students in kindergarten through third grade. It's by county and it's disaggregated um, by race and ethnicity and gender. So you can go in and see chronic absenteeism rates. It doesn't, I think the big thing with chronic absenteeism is that each district there could be multiple causes that look different, and one of the things that's so fantastic about chronic absenteeism as sort of low-hanging fruit to address other issues is that you can do meaningful community engagement to better understand the reasons and, and address them in schools have, mm -hmm. and other parts of the country have really taken this on and made real impact. I have a question. Um, I'm Sarah with the American Heart Association, and I'm wondering, have you thought about, and I'm not sure if this is already part of the um, assessments, but collecting the data on what the barriers are. I mean, you're, I hear it being discussed in terms of chronic absenteeism, but for the other factors as well, what schools are seeing, what communities are seeing in terms of what's really preventing them from getting to that next step of where they want to be with some of these indicators. Um, because that could be something very useful to, I mean, it sounds like they're talking about it at the local level, but to be collecting that information could be useful as well. So one of the things, um, I know that Les went through the assessment tool very, very quickly, but I think also on the end of the tool that we did not get to see, there is a section where they are to input kind of local data, comments, um, reasons for, different data points, we can certainly look to enhance that in the assessment tool, because I, I do think that that is important. Um, but I think we might need to clarify and build that part of the assessment tool out even more. So that could be a next step for us. Definitely. 
and even the looking at the school dropout data, mm -hmm. since we're looking at the whole K-12, to see why students are dropping out. Yeah, Dr. Um, Martin, I'd be interested to see whether or not residency is a factor with the political climate and immigration and how that may impact Latino students here who come from dual residency household where one parent is here illegally and then you have the other parent who is legal, how that may have an okay. Definitely. Anything else? It looks like at our next uh, quarterly meeting we may do a deep dive on the mm -hmm. absence issue and bring some additional data to the table as well. Yeah, I, w I was just going to suggest that uh, you know, once the pilots get going, we'll have a lot of things to talk about. But prior to that time, we probably really need to pick some topics that we know that can be addressed without you know, right now. Uh, the, the immunization thing is sort of a pet peeve of mine because I just don't understand why we ever have to suspend any kid for that. Uh, so there may be issues like that, that working cross-agency, there can be a lot of collaboration on. So I would encourage everybody, to, no idea is a bad idea. This has been a very unstructured committee. So send, uh, send it to Ellen, um, and uh, next time we hope to get an agenda out sooner with, with a specific topic. Also, the other thing is there's always room at the table for other stakeholders that, that you may be aware of. Um, I think that every agency of, of government has a role with respect to healthy children, uh, and we all are preached upon about the return on investment that we have to make sure the children are successful. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing how we can get a, a level of co uh, collaboration across the state without additional money. Uh, that would be the real great story to tell. We have resources already out there, both public and private, we can take care of these needs. The, the issue is that we're not well coordinated and directed. And um, the, I, I'm, I'm really impressed with the assessment tool, the ability to assess a community and say, well, why, why are our numbers the way they are? I think we'll guide a lot. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm looking forward to is people say, well, gee, I didn't know that, and then announce it to the community and have people come forward to, to take advantage of it. So, Thank you all for all of your time and effort and uh, uh, commitment. Um, I want to keep this thing as flexible as possible because I think that's the way it works best to make the, uh, your individual communities successful because you know your community's best. And so to the extent that our staff can enable you to do that, if you're not a pilot, that's fine. There's still, still some things to do. If you're in an agency and you've got some uh, cross collaboration ideas that you think that need to be done. Use this as a as a means by which we coordinate those cross collaborations. And I'd even forgotten uh, Dr. Harvey about that after school issue. Thanks for the shout out. I mean, it was uh, to me it was kind of a nonsensical thing. We had an after school program in which there were was money paid for after school food, and there was some regulation or some regulator. They didn't understand that need to be done, and as soon as, as, soon as it was made aware, it, the barrier fell out, and, 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 the, and the program was able to get forward. That's what this kind of communication does for people. So thank you all for your time. I thank uh, the, the presenters for ending 30 minutes early. That's awful nice. <laughs> Have a safe trip. I'll be